Chers auditeurs, Dear listeners, bonjour. Welcome in Comdarchi Podcast Season 4. Saison 4 dans le monde fascinant des architectes. And in the architectural projects. Je suis Anne-Charlotte de Ponte, passionnée d'architecture et docteur des universités en histoire de l'archi. I am one of the spokespersons of Anne Charlotte, who is a PhD in architecture history. Merci. Thank you. D'être avec moi aujourd'hui. To be with us today. Et and maintenant, now, lundi en français, place au talent. And Wednesday, let's talk projects. In English, of course. Bienvenue dans Comme d'Archie. Dear listeners, hello and welcome to our summer series in season four of Comme d'Archie. This is Esther for Anne Charlotte. Today, we're going to tell you about a Santon castle, named after those poems composed of fragments borrowed from other works. It's the Château de la Punta in Alata, Corsica. We explore this castle, one of the most southerly in France, based on a summary I wrote. Before discovering La Punta, let's follow the authors of the Touring Club de France, May 15th, 1900s. For the road leading to the castle is as much a part of its history as the architecture it quotes. We leave Ajaccio on the road to Bastia. We leave it to take the road to Alata and the Col de Carbinica. On the right, we ride along the Padule stream, which waters a magnificent plain covered with orange trees. We pass under the Gravona viaduct, which supplies Ajaccio with drinking water. The road climbs steadily towards the Col de Pruneau. At this point, we leave the Alatas Road to take the special castle road, which twists and turns to take us past the chapel, mausoleum of the Pozzo di Borgo family, and then past the castle's electricity plant. We've climbed 660 meters. And indeed, if the castle's difficult access did not prevent it from being built, it did jeopardize its use, for it was shortly inhabited. Built between 1887 and 1894 by the Duke Jérôme Pozzo di Borgo and his son Charles Pozzo di Borgo, the Château de la Punta is a recreation of one of the pavilions from the Palais des Tuileries. A recreation, not a reconstruction, for although the building reuses some of the very materials of the Tuileries Palace, the plans and facades have been reworked. The castle is set on a 7,000 square meter terrace between the Gulf of Sagon and the Monte Cinto, Corsica's highest mountain, to the north, and Ajaccio to the south. It was once surrounded by formal gardens and a vast estate planted with flowers, olive trees, etc. The Renaissance Pavilion, part of which is recreated here, was built by and named after Jean Bulon. It was burned down by the Paris Commune in May 1871, along with the rest of the Tuileries. The perpetrators followed the fire from the terrace of the Louvre, where they were dining on a cold meal. Jean Bulan was also the architect of the Petit Château at Chantilly and the Château de Couen, considered one of the earliest examples of the colossal order in France. The latter inspired the paneling in the Grand Salon of our castle. The Tuileries Palace, to return to the subject, was another project of the great builder Catherine de Médicis, mentioned in the episode on the Château de Chenonceau. The Tuileries, as we said, was destroyed in a three-day fire. In 1883, although the building could have been restored, the National Assembly voted to demolish the ruins. The materials were auctioned off. The heritage was sold to the highest bidder. Fragments of the Tuileries can be found today in the Château de Varax, Rhône region, the Villa Magali, Var region, the Presidential Palace in Ecuador, and the Villa des Palmiers, Italy, to name but four. Concerning the recreation at La Punta, I quote Louis Campi in his Rapport sur les travaux et découvertes archéologiques dans le département de la Corse, 1897. 
It is a curious observation that, in the future, to enjoy the real view of the ancient home of the kings of France, it will be necessary to come to Corsica. Indeed, the Comte Charles Pozzo di Borgo, deputy of Corsica, bought a batch of sculpted stones from the Tuileries. They were photographed in situ, then numbered, catalogued, and shipped to Corsica. A seven kilometers road was dug into the rock using dynamite to reach the chosen location. On this subject, I quote again from the Touring Club de France, May 15, 1900. One cannot believe the difficulties that had to be overcome to bring such a bold undertaking to a successful conclusion. Neither the enormity of the expense, which amounted to several million, nor the numerous accidents resulting from transport by sea and by land in a very mountainous region, nor the landing operations during which many materials, having fallen into the sea, had to be fished out by scuba divers for fantastic sums. None of this succeeded in shaking the resolve of the Duc de Pozzo di Borgo, who had decided, whatever the cost, to endure his country with a true marvel. The stones finally arrive in the Corsican Maquis. At La Punta, architect Charles Vincent designed a mosaic castle which reproduces and is composed of fragments of other architectures. Even the park gate comes from the Chateau de Saint-Cloud, demolished during the War of 1870. The fragments, mainly from the Tuileries, are metal-reinforced stone elements. This technique of reinforced stone had been used in France since the 12th century, and even earlier with pieces of wood. It can be found, for example, at the Saint-Chapelle in Paris. The Punta building is more modest. It comprises a basement, two levels, and the attic. The different elevations of the Chateau de la Punta are united and harmonized by the entablature that encircles the building. This cornice features modillions and rosettes, with a frieze depicting cornucopias and suns. The slate roof is lined with cork tiles for better insulation. While the east and west facades are sister buildings, both adorned with Renaissance pilasters, the north and south facades are distant cousins. Berlin's art is therefore positioned to the north, overlooking the Gulf of Sagan. The two ionic columns on either side of the entrance are taken from the central pavilion of the Tuileries Palace, known as the Pavillon de l'Horloge. They are attributed to architect and sculptor Jean Goujon. All the finesse of Renaissance sculpture can be found in the friezes, entablatures, and various mouldings adorning the windows and doors. The pediment is inspired by that of the Galerie d'Apollon in the Louvre. It features a glory, two caryatids, and the Pozzo di Borgo coat of arms. The Russian eagle granted by the Tsars, the Fleur de Lys, a concession from Louis XVIII, and the castle with three silver towers on a rock representing their Corsican land. Below the coat of arms is the following inscription, engraved in a red marble plaque. Jérôme, Duc Pozzo di Borgo, and Charles, his son, had this edifice built with stones from the Tuileries Palace, burned down in Paris in 1871, to preserve for the Corsican homeland a precious souvenir of the French homeland in the year of our Lord, 1891. Note the erudition or sensitivity of the Pozzo di Borgo family, long known for their wisdom. They have been advisors to kings and tzars, deputies and protectors of the Corsican people under Genoese domination, and decorated military officers. Their motto is Virtute et Concilio. This can be translated as with courage and wisdom, or power and counsel, or virtue and counsel. The south facade, though more restrained, features some of the work of Philibert de Lhomme, who was responsible for the design of the Tuileries. Eight ionic columns frame the ground floor base. 
They are surmounted by an entablature, also ionic, and then eight Corinthian columns on the second floor. Sprigs of fleur de lis, topped with Catherine de Medici's cipher, climb up the flutes of the columns. The whole is crowned by a second Corinthian entablature. The double-railed grand staircase comes from the former Hôtel de Ville in Paris, also burned down during the Commune. The Four Seasons sculptural group opposite is of the same provenance. It was created by Jean-Baptiste de Bay. Let's return north to climb the monumental staircase leading to the entrance. The vestibule is 17 meters long and 15 wide. To the right, a grand staircase in the style of Henri II, but in the form of a Louis XIV, leads to the upper floors. The carved wooden coffered ceiling of the Grand Salon is a copy of that in the Château de la Palisse. The wood paneling is inspired by the Château des Courants, while that in the dining room is composed from antique fragments. The finely carved doors in the dining room, also in the Henri II style, come from the Château d'Amboise. The library, on the other hand, is in the Empire style. On the third floor, the chapel is adorned with Louis XVI's paneling. As we see, the Château de la Punta is a form of three-dimensional palimpsests, an open-air archive. This technical, aesthetic and historical masterpiece bears witness to French savoir-faire from the Renaissance to the 20th century and to the dedicated erudite who did not allow our history to be erased by its own violence. The castle was listed as a Monument Historique in 1970, then classified, in part, in 1977. Unfortunately, a year later, in 1978, a Maki fire burnt the roof and framework. The stones which have obviously seen it all before, remained. In 1991-92, the castle was sold to the Conseil Général de la Corse du Sud. The furniture had been sold by the previous owner or transferred to Paris and the Musée Fèche in Ajaccio. In 1996, the lost framework was replaced by a metal structure, a new roof was installed, and some dormer windows were closed with plexiglass but the interiors had already been badly damaged by almost 20 years of harsh weather. The castle is currently being restored by the Collectivité de Corse. The first part could be visible as early as 2024. Bulan's famous north façade has already been renovated. What remains is the south façade by Philibert de Lorme. A subscription is open to support the restoration of the monument. Dear listeners, thank you for tuning in. Let's meet again next week for a new summer episode of Kamdashi. We'll be taking you on a new architectural journey to the heart of a well-known castle, the castle of the women who protected and preserved it. Until then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. Thanks to Julien Robourg, sound engineer, who is collaborating with us today. Don't forget to tune in to our previews on Instagram at Comme d'Archie Podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, don't hesitate to promote it by giving it five stars and a little comment on Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast platform. And above all, subscribe to listen to all of our episodes for free. See you soon, and until then, take care of yourself.